Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Sunset Safari. For those of you who don't know, my name is Jamie, and I have Jandre on camera with me this afternoon. And somewhere out there on Wendy is Scott, along with Viam, the wildebeest. We also have Nikki and Jess and FC and Eugene and Al not sorry, Peter and Alex sorting out all of our technical issues. And if you're wondering where I am on this blazing afternoon, I'm about 50 meters outside of camp, having just escaped there. Luckily, the Kudu presented a perfect opening shot for us. Now, for those of you who might have missed the Sunrise Safari, we found those two Nkuhuma lionesses on the termite mound. Um, we were called into that sighting by Wolby back on Juma. Now, as far as I know, Scott's heading across in that direction for this afternoon's drive to see what those two are going to get up to. I'm going to head to the western section of Juma. It's been quite a long time since I've been there, as well as on to Arethusa to see what's happening around there and follow up with any of our leopards. Since I haven't seen a leopard track on Juma in about two or three days, I thought I might try a little bit further afield. Let's just get one more nice view of these kudus, since they did present themselves oh so obligingly to us <laughs> about 30 seconds before we went live. what they're doing standing in the blazing sun. It's certainly not where I would be if I were a kudu. And I said this afternoon is hot. It's 30 degrees centigrade, which is 85 degrees Fahrenheit. But it definitely feels warmer when you're sitting in the sun. And perhaps I should go and find a nice shady drainage line to go and drive and see what we can find there. Here you see the little ox picker hopping along her back, picking off the ticks. Definitely one of the most beautiful antelope that we get on in the Sabi Sands, if you want my opinion. And that is where we are if you are joining us for the first time. We drive around on Juma and Arethusa game reserves within the Sabi Sands, within the Greater Kruger National Park area in South Africa. And this is a live safari, so everything you see is happening in real time right here. We're also interactive, so if you have any questions that you want to ask us, please don't be shy, just let us know. And you can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Then you let us know what your thoughts and opinions are on this beautifully glorious afternoon. But time is getting on, and I think it's time for us to go and find what else we can around here. I'm thinking that most things are going to be hiding around in the shade, so let's go check some of those deeper drainage lines and see what we can see. I did hear that there were some elephants at the Juma Dam. Scott's headed off in that direction, so I'm sure if they're around he will encounter them. I'll let you know. drives I try and spend a little bit of time researching up on different topics. This afternoon since it was Sunday I engaged in a game of Trivial Pursuit which I have not played since I was probably about 16. Unfortunately it didn't go very well for me and I lost the game to Brent which I wasn't terribly impressed with. What's up go away burn? Why are you shouting? for the fun of it, or at another go-away bird, and see any birds of prey. What have you spotted? Are you just shouting? 
just him. He's sitting on the top of that bright green acacia at the back there. He might have been calling it a bird of prey. Here he is, right at the top. And those are the sort of sounds that we look for and are especially telling when you're on fresh leopard tracks. Especially if you start to hear some of the antelope cough and bark. Or squirrels start to shout as well. But I think he's just been talking to his neighborly go away birds. There doesn't seem to be anything here. They will also alarm call at snakes as well. So it's sometimes useful <coughs> if you're looking for those kinds of things, but of course very difficult to see. Especially as this grass is getting greener and thicker, you have to sort of scour the bottom of trees. But I have found a snake or two before like that, whilst obsessively trying to follow up on a go-away bird call. But I think in this case, he was just having a conversation with one of his neighbours. My plan for this afternoon consists of heading across to Arethusa and after I've done that, maybe depending on what I find there, maybe head back to check on the hyena den since they pulled a very sneaky maneuver on me this morning. And this morning one of the guides reported that he was at the hyena den and that it was very active, there were lots of babies about. And by the time I got there I got an update from some of the viewers to say that the hyenas were back at the Juma Dam camera at the dam and indeed when we got there the den site was completely deserted the cubs had all gone to bed decided that was where they want to be I wouldn't mind having another look at what those cubs are up to that some of the viewers reported seeing elephants at the Juma Dam or on the Juma Dam camera but I didn't realize that they'd also been seen at the Arethusa camera as well now I think Scott is going to go and head across in that direction so I'm going to unless I bump into them somewhere on my route I'm going to let him follow up on the elephants around that area whilst I carry on I'm sure he will call them in if they're close but since we're going to Arethusa I'll definitely be keeping an eye out for those eddies. If we keep having days like this, a couple in a row, there's going to, the water sources are going to be severely depleted. And this is what sometimes happens, especially in drought years, and I noticed it last year as well. Last year we also got unseasonably early rains and then sort of towards everything came out, it was all green, everything was looking beautiful and then October came and there was no rain and November came there was no rain. It got hotter and hotter and the winds started to blow through in October and everything started going brown much sooner than it should. I'm really hoping that's not going to be the case this year definitely need some good rains. And also, just to let you know, there's an update and I'm sure many of the regular viewers who follow the other lodge pages might know this. But the five Birmingham boys were seen on Hoffman's this morning, which is just south of Gowrie Main. They were very far south of Hoffman's, quite close to the Marla Marla border. 
and they were there with it seems to be confirmed or sort of the common consensus is that it was a Styx female that they're mating with and they're still mating with her could be very very interesting still wondering why these Nkuhumas have come all the way back here and what their plans are and whether or not they're going to remain split from the rest of the members of their pride, or what's going to happen there. We'll just have to wait and see. I think on my way to Arethusa, I might pay a quick visit to Treehouse Dam to see if anything's been around and about there to have a drink. There's very, very little groundwater left. So a lot of the animals are back to relying almost entirely on the dams. drainage line to see if I can see any signs of those ellies. They do sometimes make their way on a fairly regular basis from the dam to this area because they love all of the freshly sprouting baboon tail. And whilst I double check and look for deep shapes, deep dark shapes in the grey, you can, must be wondering what is Scott has been up to so let's head across to him for now and I'll be back with you a little bit later. Good afternoon everyone and welcome on board with myself Scott for those of you who are joining for the first time and haven't met me before and I'm teamed up with Viem aka the Wildebeest on camera it's a hot afternoon as I'm sure Jamie's mentioned to you guys so our plan is to try and find some cool shady areas where hopefully there will be some animals seeking refuge and if any of you are joining for the first time what I would suggest is taking note of how quiet the bush felt is at the moment when we stop the vehicle compared to the noise we are going to hear as it cools down at around sunset it's quite a dramatic change and it's important to know that a lot of the animals now because of the heat are lying low in the shade. Elephants of course would probably be the most likely animals to be on the move now. They've got great thermoregulation that can cope with this hot weather and also birds of prey. Just spotted one. Hopefully it's not going to fly away from us. It's always a bit of a gamble. Ah, oh, it's working out perfectly. It's heading straight towards us. Yeah, it's turned perfectly because VM couldn't tilt the camera anymore on the tripod. Imagine being up there. Well, actually, you don't have to imagine it because there's a strong chance later on on drive you'll be up there with Andrew piloting the drone. And that was a female Batelier Eagle. They are one of the... Oh, we need to get a quick link to Jamie. She's got some action. Welcome back and we very much apologize for abruptly pulling you away from Scott like that. I just want to wait here for a moment to see if he carries on. But our one horned impala friend has just chased a female around us about, what is it, John Ray? Three times? Four times? At least four times. Sprinting around us like completely mad creatures. I don't know what he's trying to do because he's definitely got the wrong time of year for this kind of chaos. I'll shift forward a bit so we can see if he's going to carry on. I apologize, I thought he was going to. That was highly entertaining. He chased her round and round and round and round. This poor female was looking absolutely exhausted. Let's see what he's up to in here. Oh, 
Yukon friend has settled down again. Sorry to have dragged you away from Scott's bird of prey. This is the herd of Impala. I don't know why he's decided that he's going to keep them herded. He's got completely the wrong time of year. But I did completely interrupt Scott and since all of the action has stopped, let's head back across to him so he can show you the bird of prey and I will catch up with you a little bit later. Well, always worth trying to rush you across to any interesting sightings. But sadly, it seems like you missed the moment of madness there. I'm not too sure, VM, why you've zoomed out, because I just wanted to explain quickly what was going on, so do you mind zooming back in? Um, so, this is the beautiful eagle that we saw fly past us earlier. And I wanted to just show you in the book quickly how you differentiate the male who's half black, half white under his wings, compared to that of the female, which is mainly white. And the easy way that I remember is that you could imagine a lady in a white wedding dress, I guess with black shoes would be a bit controversial, but that's the case over here. And the male wearing a tuxedo, half black, half white. Interestingly enough, the juvenile, which you can see here, takes about five to eight years to get its adult plumage. And what we can read into that is that birds of prey live for many, many years. Possibly 50 years or plus is not uncommon. So they've got a long lifespan, these birds. And these are mainly carrion searchers. They search for carcasses and are great help to us when if when we find them in a tree they often lead us to leopards <coughs> Woo! excuse me um, so they do help us find animals with their kills but they can also hunt for themselves so they have mixed skills but the majority of their food I think does come from scavenging and they're a low-flying scavenger Unlike vultures who tend to soar much higher up in the sky looking for carcasses, the battalions often fly quite low, so they're often the first to the scene of the crime. afternoon David in the UK and it's good to have you on board I'm just going to reverse quickly because David says we very often point out dead leadwood trees but we very seldom point out the live ones and that's a good point a very very good point David so just for those viewers who may be new to the show I just thought I'd like to show them a dead leadwood tree which we've just passed this is a beautiful one on our right they can stand for hundreds of years after they've died because they are so dense and hard that termites cannot eat through the wood and that's what allows them to stand for many many years after they have died and who knows this tree could be anywhere between 500 and a thousand years old they're very slow growing trees and it's not the heaviest tree, but it's one of the heaviest trees in this area. And is about 1,250 kilograms per cubic meter. So take a look. You'll see quite a few fine grooves within the bark. Well, not the bark, actually. The bark's actually fallen off this tree. But take a close look at this, and then you can compare it to a live tree that I'll show you later. And it won't take long for us to find you a great specimen of a living leadwood. The living leadwood you'll notice when we show it to you has got very rectangular puzzle pieces of bark. But let's go and find one for you guys. grove of 
them in the Milwati Riverbed, which you're about to cross through. I sadly don't think we can drive down it because the signal is a little bit shaky at the moment in the riverbed. So we're trying to work out how to broadcast from there because we used to be able to. Anyway, I'm going to catch up with you guys when we get to the Ledwood trees and Jamie's found a bird that she would like to show you. I didn't want to <laughs> show you a grey hornbill, but much like my impala, he wasn't being very cooperative. He was perfectly static for ages in the tree, and then the minute you came around to my side of things, he immediately disappeared. And the reason I wanted to show him to you is you don't often get to see grey hornbills, and he's completely vanished now. That was hugely inconsiderate of him. Oh, there he is. See him there, Jandre. Don't move. Please don't. Oh. Oh, dear. Well, I found you some buffalo, and I don't think they're going to run away. I'm very sorry, though, to have interrupted Scott twice there for two animals that really didn't want to cooperate. big herd of dugger boys actually. I think they might be the ones that usually live at the treehouse or close to treehouse down. And they've definitely spent the afternoon in the mud, judging by the amount of it that's covering them. Very slowly making their way through. And the one thing I had noticed and I've remarked upon it before is that it's been a long time since we've seen, or at least not a long time, but I definitely haven't seen as many groups of dugger boys, or mud boys as they're known, as I have in the past. But I've also never seen such large herds of them moving through as I have since I started working here. It's quite phenomenal. Well, at least they can't fly away or run away or stop what they're doing since they've been doing pretty much the same same thing the whole time. It's happily grazing away on the grass. Nice new fresh shoots for them to eat. What I'm going to do is try and make Jandre's life a little bit easier since it is straight into the sun. Just loop around and get some of the ones that I saw on the other side that we can show you. I think let's do that since these are right facing northwest and the sun is blisteringly in our eyes. Let's loop around and go back towards the others that are coming out. It's a big herd. There's about there's probably about 30 to yeah, 30 of them or so, maybe even more. They're all slowly they're making their way up from Treehouse Dam. So it's definitely that group of Duggar boys that we see there on a fairly regular basis. And maybe if I go back there, the grey hornbill will come back and show himself once again. Keeping my eyes peeled. breeze blowing though. That definitely helps to take the edge off the heat. It's alright Buffalo. Hello. He seemed to 
have very red eyes, that guy. But wow, look at the breadth of horns on this one. Look at how wide set his horns are. I don't know if it's because of the way that they curve that makes them look so much wider than others. But they do look absolutely enormous. And those little pieces there that you can see, the brown pieces on the top of the horns, those are bits of bark from where he's been rubbing and scratching his horns on trees. He's not that huge inside, but he does have an enormous set of horns. And you can just imagine how perilous it must be to be a lion trying to hunt one of these. With such a heavy horn base and 800 kilograms worth of buffalo behind it carrying the momentum of probably moving at about 40 to 50 kilometers an hour. They're seriously quite dangerous animals to take on. But this guy in particular has some of the widest horns that I've seen while I've been here. the way that they curved. Oh, but apparently the other guy agreed. Now I must say that buffalo are probably the animals that I'm most cautious of when I'm out walking, especially on areas like this. Not so much buffalo herds, but definitely buffalo bulls. They tend to be slightly moody, slightly grumpy, and just in general tend to pop up in very unexpected places. And Lindsay, you were wondering if I've ever had a scary experience with a Cape Buffalo. And the answer is yes, one or two. I've climbed one or two trees in response to their presence. I can't say that the sight of one, they've got that look where they find, when they first see you and they look at you with their heads up, <clears throat> and they look down their noses at you and it is quite a fearsome look but for the most part it's important to remember that they are just as scared as you scared of you as you are of them and of course always very important to remember not to run away from them unless you absolutely have somewhere to run to oh this guy's lost a horn <laughs> but I do find them I would say that they're probably the animals I tend to be most wary of. Buffalo bulls and elephant breeding herds. I also think that they have very strong, very basic instincts. It's either fight or flight. You know, an elephant will stop and consider you for a while and think about it. Buffalo tend not to same, show the same level of thought process. And just in case anybody's ever been confused between a buffalo and a wildebeest, we do actually have a wildebeest here as well within our sighting. But he's very much into the sun. I'm going to show him to you anyway, just so you can get an idea as to the size difference. I know that I've had many people question me when they first come to visit Africa, so for new viewers it's a nice way of showing you. But I have had people call wildebeest buffalo. And just to give you a bit of an idea, there's probably about 600 kilograms of weight difference between them. Let's see if our wildebeest friend will stick around. Watching me. let him move out. Oh, buffalo startled him. There you go, you can see how much more finely proportioned and thin he is. I say 600 kilograms, it's probably more like 400 kilograms difference, but still considerable. So for those two lionesses who are wandering around Juma and probably starting to feel a little bit hungry, this guy would be the perfect 
sized prey for them, or even something a little bit smaller. But a big Cape buffalo is definitely not the way to go. if there isn't another cold front on the way, hopefully bringing with it some rain, some rain and relief from this heat. Not that I mind, I love being, I love being hot like this, but I think we could use some of it. beautifully green at the moment and the animals are loving it. I probably shouldn't crash into the upper leaf. And James from Kansas City, the one thing that we've noticed is brought out is the various insects. Insects? And you were wondering when the tick season starts. And that the answer is it depends on the type of tick you're talking about. I'm gonna pop myself here. I don't want to scare him off. He's a little bit skittish, but it's nice to see a wildebeest. It's been a while, even if it is unfortunately into direct sun. But James, yes, the tick season has definitely been happening in autumn and in winter. I notice we get a very high proportion of pepper ticks, but it is going to, so the pepper ticks are the little tick larva and they absolutely love me. There's just something about me that they adore. Mosquitoes can't really be bothered. They generally bite the person next to me, but pepper ticks somehow. And they have a wonderful way of biting you in funny places like in the crease of your knee. And they make very uncomfortable itchy bites. But yes, as the rains increase over the next few months, we're going to see lots more in the way of ticks. I've been trying to have a look now while I've been answering your question at the poor buffalo who of course are really the ones who get to complain about the ticks but I don't see any clear views of them so we can have a look at some of them but yes post big rains there's going to be a lot more coming out it's usually around November and December that we start to see them in serious numbers luckily Unlike the ones, unlike the ticks that you get in Europe and in America, they don't pass on Lyme disease. The ticks in South Africa will give you a rather nasty flu-like feeling, but they won't give you Lyme disease and it's very easily treated. Oh, I think Scott has found the hornbill that I lost earlier, so let's head across to him. I will catch up with you a little bit later. Welcome back everyone. And this is the southern grey hornbill that Jamie was trying to show you earlier. There must be a caterpillar hatching on this acacia tree because I can see it hopping from branch to branch feeding. And I've also noticed another hornbill in this tree, a yellow-billed hornbill. So the words obviously spread. But there are lots of it. Looks like a caterpillar or a worm that they're feeding on. Oh there it goes. Oh, well done, Viam. Great work on the camera there. That is the southern grey hornbill. It's the most drab of the hornbills that we get here. The most common are the red billed and yellow billed, which understandably have got brightly coloured beaks. So I'm glad we got to at least show you that bird that. <clears throat> Jamie tried to earlier and I can't stress enough I was saying this morning how we will always take these gambles to try and show you either birds or exciting things happening like the impala that were behaving interestingly that Jamie tried to rush you across to but a lot of the time it won't work out but that's the joy of being on a live safari because when we do get it right then I guess the enjoyment will be that much sweeter 
up, Dave, in the UK. I haven't forgotten about the leadwood trees, but sadly, the spot that I went to earlier didn't have good signal where there was a whole grove of these trees. So I'm going to try and find you another good specimen. slowly make our way up towards the Buffles Hook waterhole. I think that the two lioness that Jamie spent time with this morning who were nearby that waterhole could well have headed there during the course of the day to quench their thirst. Failing that we will return to their last position. But I think while it's still going to be worthwhile to check that water hole because even if the lion aren't there we may find a herd of elephant drinking or if we're lucky even swimming it's something we don't really see in the winter months but come summer it's the most awesome thing seeing a whole herd of elephants swimming through a water hole using their trunks like periscopes to keep their oxygen levels high as their heads are held below the water seeing a host of different animals that occur here during the winter months but even the animals that we do see during the winter months will start behaving very very differently in the summer a little bug just flew into my eye and it's released an acid that's quite burny uh, I would look back and show you, but then the burning acid combined with the sun is going to cause me to go temporarily blind. I can't seem to get it out. They release a burning acid. Young kudu. There's another one coming into the clearing, VM. They've got massive, massive ears, the kudu. This one's multitasking. As you can see, holding its tail up. And the reason why they have massive ears is because they are predominantly found in thick bush. Being browsers of leaves, they naturally need to be in quite well wooded vegetation in order to acquire their favorite food. And therefore having great eyesight alone wouldn't be much use to them. And it pays for them to have these massive satellite ears that can help them to detect any prey that are, or predators rather, that are approaching them. And they're not too far from where these lionesses were left, but heading in to a safe area away from where those lionesses were. Lionesses were probably about half a mile off to our left. Lilac breasted roller that just flew over. We're just keeping an eye on it because they do a wonderful display at this time of the year. We managed to capture a portion of that display on the Sunrise Safari again thanks to VM's great camera work. There's another brightly colored bird that's just flying off ahead of us. I think it's a brown hooded kingfisher. It keeps dodging us flying off as we 
approach, but this time it might stick around. No. continue to seek out a living deadwood deadwood leadwood for Dave in the UK Lynn has asked a good question on the topic of leadwoods and she'd like to know if they will burn if there's a bushfire well it depends on the intensity of the fire but there's a strong chance that only a very small portion of the tree will burn and the whole thing won't actually burn and fall down so what I'll try and do is find you some specimens that have been partially burnt but not entirely but it's a problem when fighting fires archer the the harder trees like the leadwoods because they are so hard they burn for many many days they're very slow burning trees so you may think the fire is completely put out but a leadwood tree or a bush willow tree may continue to smolder very very slowly and come the next windy weather the next gust of wind it fuels that fire with oxygen and then starts another fire so it's important to make sure all these hardwood stumps and logs are properly extinguished otherwise I could kick into gear again they usually are quite fire resistant unless you built a massive fire at the base of one of them the fire is that blitz through at high speed aren't capable of actually igniting them to a point that they'll continue to burn bug is still in my eye what I'm going to do is do the eyelid over the bottom eyelid technique and then look around that sometimes helps I think that little trick worked and it seems to be gone for now be at the Buffalo Zook waterhole in a minute or two and I'm confident there's going to be something happening there a large amount of elephants moving through the sands at the moment so very high up on the list of potential candidates to see there Checking carefully along road to see if there's any tracks of those two lioness making their way in this direction, but no clear signs. Oh, there's some leopard tracks heading down here. Very good. Not sure how fresh they are. And they're going to be difficult to show you guys, but let me see if I can't find a good spot show you some looks like a female leopard oh hang on tracks are going up and down here but we'll try our best one comes out but she's heading towards the water can you go have you got that one not too bad over here mm -hmm. and then 
over here, there's another track going back in that direction. It's not very clear. But what may have happened is that this leopard may have a kill nearby and has gone to the waterhole for a drink and then come back on the very same pathway to return to her kill. The tracks look quite fresh to me. Certainly on top of vehicle tracks that would have driven here this morning. The things are looking promising. confident we're going to find a female leopard with a kill. So that's a very pleasant surprise and who knows maybe those lioness will be in that same area because the lioness are just off to that side of the vehicle and maybe they would have smelt that carcass and they'll maybe help lead us to her. But what I'm going to have to do from here is spend some time on foot making sure I find out where her tracks leave the road because that will in all likelihood lead us to where she has a kill. I'm feeling very confident the tracks are all on top of the vehicle tracks from this morning and tracks going up and down. The reason why I walk quite far down the road is that it's important not just to check a very small area. The more of an area you check for the tracks, the better idea you get of their freshness, of the fact that she would have gone all the way to the waterhole and then returned on the same pathway. So good prospects. Just going to jump in to see what Jamie's up to. She's ready to receive you. Because like I say, I, re I really want to focus on this. So she is ready to get you guys. And I want to continue spending some time on foot and hopefully find this leopard with a kill. Welcome back. And you've caught us at just the right moment. As we enter onto Arethusa to see what we can find here. Now what would really be useful is if I don't have any updates from the various Arethusa guides, you guys could let me know which direction you think those elephants left in, just so I know where to be keeping an eye out for them. And you can do that obviously on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv and I'd be keen to hear which way they went. I suspect they might have gone west into the drainage line, but I could well be wrong. So let me know, please, and thank you. And how exciting is it that Scott's picked up on those leopard tracks? Now, I've just heard him call it into the radio, so it sounds like he's on the same road we were this morning, and there definitely weren't any leopard tracks there. So I wonder if Karuna's made another appearance. That would be very interesting if she did in that area because that's exactly where I saw her last just before she disappeared into the drainage line and we had to shut down because it was raining particularly hard. But that would be very, very interesting. She's an elusive cat, Karuna. I'm also on the lookout as well, on Parallel Road South as always, for tracks of shadow. Curious to see or hear about where she might be at the moment. I'll keep my eyes peeled. Definitely is known to enjoy this area. Since I am here and I finally arrived on Arethusa. Ah. I can hear the guys very clearly on the Arethusa radio, which makes for a wonderful change. So just bear with me a moment whilst I try and ask for updates. So let them finish up their conversation first. I 
give them a moment just to finish up what they're talking about and then get back to you in a moment. I'm heading across to northern, southern Safari Donga to see what we can see over there. It's a very popular leopard hiding spot. from Gracie who is eight years old. Hi Gracie, it's great to have you watching the show as always. And Gracie wanted me to wish Nurse Angie a big happy birthday, not only from me but all of the Wild Earth team. And Angie, apparently you are watching from home, so happy, happy birthday. I hope it's a wonderful day. Send through, maybe you never know, we might be able to find something special for your birthday. I'll be looking out for a nice flower or something along those lines. But Nurse Andy is the one who introduced a couple of children to watching the show and I think it's a wonderful thing. And Gracie, I'm not sure if you were watching this morning, but Bob the Bachelor is still safely tucked away at Wiffles Hook Dam. So he's, the hippo is still around and I've noticed that his tracks very often go up and down from the other part of hippos at Sydney's Dam. So he's definitely not too lonely. Oh, I really want to find a flower quickly for Angie's birthday. I'm going to be keeping my eyes peeled. road of Arethusa and it seems as though the radio might have gone quiet briefly so let me try and get hold of some of the guides such as Ryan or Sean. Nope, no they're still talking. They obviously have a lot to chat about. Afternoon stations, Jamie Wild Earth, are there any updates from this morning or this afternoon? Ellie's, which some of whom have just crossed over the northern boundary. But I don't know if that's the same Ellie's that you might have picked up on on the Arethusa Dam camera. It becomes amazing when you drive, when you're regularly driving these areas so frequently and you really start to, it starts to become impossible not to drive a road without some kind of sightings memory attached to it. Like those so many months ago driving around here and bumping into that Nkuruma, I'm oh sorry not Nkuruma, it was a Styx female. The Styx lioness just randomly by the side of the road. Total surprise. And it's one of my favorite things about living in an area and working there for an extended period of time. The one thing you do start to do though, or I personally start to do, is your mind tricks you into thinking that where you once saw that animal, you start to look for it there every time you go past.
question as we sort of generally just bumbling along to try and see what we can see. And that question comes from Joyce, who's watching all the way in New Hampshire. And Joyce would like to know if the, I think this is what Joyce is asking, whether or not the Woodlands Kingfishers are back. Unfortunately, every now and again, my communication system with the outside world does go a little bit fuzzy. But Joyce, not yet. It's still a little bit early until the woodlands are back. I haven't heard them yet. And they usually announce their arrival very soon after arriving. With that incredibly distinctive call of theirs. But a really beautiful bird. And for those of you who don't know, they are intra-African migrants. So they move up into sort of central and northern Africa during the winter months down here and then they come back for our summers to breed and they perform these incredibly elaborate mating displays where the females and the males stand next to each other and they raise their wings out and chirp repeatedly at each other and we will be seeing it soon but not just yet I think towards October sometime we should start to get the first ones coming back it's nice to hear that Scott also heard a glasses cuckoo this morning, which, whilst it isn't a migratory species exactly, you don't hear it during the winter months. It's not very, it's a very, um, what's the word? Very shy, very well hidden bird until it gets to breeding season where it starts to call. So it's nice to have them back in the area at vocal. The squirrel's shouting at something. shade here and have a listen. What have you spotted, squirrel? Oh, he's very upset about something. This is a very good place for a leopard to be hiding. He's back a little bit. Let's reverse back and see what we can see. Keep your eyes peeled for spots in the grass or a bird of prey, but I don't see a bird of prey. It's looking it's a little bit further back. Let's go and explore what our squirrel is shouting about. Oh, it's going to be tricky though, deep in this block. Let me just get a better idea before I go barging in which direction he's calling from. Perfectly that way. He's still cross. Let's go. Let's go figure this out. Come on, into gear, Jigger. You're going to have to go around a little bit. move as quickly as possible. Oh, that's not going to be so easy. suspiciously quiet. I 
wonder what on earth he was shouting at. Okay. I'm trying to see if I can spot the offending squirrel who cried wolf, or in this case cried leopard, because he's gone completely quiet now that we've come in looking. And generally when squirrels do spot leopards, they tend to shout about it and hyperventilate for quite a while, even after the leopard has gone past them. So I don't think it was what we were looking for. All is quiet here. Very, very quiet. Squirrels leading us on a wild goose chase. Oh well, it was worth a shot. We've had plenty of amazing leopard sightings in this area. So it was worth coming to see. Oh, don't you start now. It's a very half-hearted go away bird that gave a bit of a croak. Not really anything serious, just a sort of a wee sound. Nope. All is really suspiciously quiet down here. It's gone absolutely silent. I wonder if there's something that I'm missing, but I don't think so. I think that squirrel was either shouting at a snake or something like a mongoose maybe, which would hunt them. So it's understandable from his perspective. But whatever it is, the threat seems to have passed and the school has gone dead quiet. So I think we can go about doing a quick U-turn and hop back onto the road and continue to scour the drainage lines of Arethusa. Chino John, who's one of our regular viewers, has suggested, since I did offer up the option to Andy, Angie, that on her birthday we might try and find her something special, and John suggested that we head out and find Junior, and I absolutely promise you if I knew where he was, I would do that 100%. At the moment, honestly no idea, I don't think any of us have got a clue where young Junior has headed off to. Hey everybody, watch your heads. Oh, it's quite the stump there. Here we go. Well, at least we've made it out unscathed. So I'm still not sure what that squirrel was making a fuss about. nice thing about summer, and I secretly quite like it, is that the spider webs are back out and about across the road. I just drove through one now. Just one of the little strands that come across. And it's always, it's always interesting to watch people's different reactions to spiders. I've obviously always been completely happy with them. They don't bother me in the slightest. And I know that I've mentioned before that my little brother, on the other hand, is absolutely terrified of them. And I've had guests do the most amazing things to try and get away from a spider that's, that we've driven across. You know, so I always try and catch them and bring them down before they hit the people behind me in the face. But sometimes you miss one, your concentration is elsewhere, and a spider drops into the vehicle on the odd occasion, especially in midsummer when the golden orbs are out and about. <laughs> and I've had people who are willing to abandon the safety of the vehicle despite not knowing what's out there or anything like that. They're quite willing to jump out of the car to escape an incoming spider. 
I've also had somebody who managed to levitate from the front row to the back row without touching the middle row in response to a spider. It was quite phenomenal. She launched herself backwards. <coughs> but it's my first time experiencing it with a camera on the back. And of course, the cameramen don't mind, but their cameras certainly don't appreciate shiny spider webs covering the lens. Oh, I thought I heard something. Oh, it's the Oriole. I thought it was Jandre whistling at me. <laughs> Sorry, Jandre. I just heard this perfect whistle. I thought Jandre had spotted something in the bush that I'd missed. That was a perfect imitation of a human whistle, that little call. Okay, time to explore the depth of the shadier areas of Arethusa. And I don't mean that in a dodgy kind of way, I just mean shady as in, it's a little bit cooler down here. scratch which was well timed because it's come along with Deb's question about how do ticks work do they drink blood and then fall off or do they live their entire life on the animal that they're feeding on their host and Deb it's actually quite an interesting question if you are as fascinated by the tiny creepy crawly things as I am so the ticks, there's different types of ticks, there's different species of ticks. So some of those absolutely enormous ones that we see on the bigger game species like giraffe and, and buffalo. And then some of the slightly smaller species that hang about. And those are the sort of things that you're going to find on impala and even tinier ones on things like spring hairs. So everything has their own collection of parasites, but it kind of is ranked in size depending on the size of the animal. And because of that, each tick has a different type of lifestyle. So there's one that has a one life cycle, one that has is called the two cycle, and one that's called a three cycle tick. There's different species such as bond ticks, red ticks, brown, uh, what are they called? The name's gone out of my head now. But essentially for some of them, the larvae hatch and they jump onto an animal and they then mutate whilst on the animal so they metamorphosize into the adult breed and drop off female lays her eggs and dies and then there's some that jump onto a host animal when they hatch then they drop off after they've had some blood and time to develop they then do their metamorphosis into the adult and then carry on from there so there's lots of different life cycles that happen and I'd have to double check into it because now of course off the top of my head I can't remember which one does which but I know that the larger ticks have slightly longer and they can go through one or two hosts at a time before it's the end of their complete life cycle. Driving through. 
through. And I believe that Scott is out and about and back near Buffleswick Dam, exploring that area. So let's head across and see what he's found swimming about in the dam. And I will catch up with you a little bit later. Welcome back everyone. And the tracking of that female leopard was short-lived as myself and William, who is Aubrey's tracker, bumped into a breeding herd of elephants whilst on her trail. She veered off the road almost exactly where we found those tracks and led us straight into, like I said, a breeding herd of elephants, which is probably the last animal you want to come across on foot. So we hastily made a U-turn and a turn to the vehicle. Let's take a close look at this buffalo on the right. I think I can see a terrapin moving around in between its legs. And Jamie, oh, there's actually two terrapins there. And I'm told Jamie was just telling you about ticks. And that's exactly what these terrapins are looking for. They're looking to glean those parasites off the buffalo. It's not an easy business because they can't crawl up high enough to the creases in the buffalo's skin, in the armpits. There goes another one. They seem to have given up on this buffalo who's standing a little bit high out of the water. And let's see where they move to. Most of the ticks will latch onto the softest parts of skin. And like I said, those are in the armpits and in the folds of skin. which most of the standing up buffalo are not presenting to the little terrapins. And terrapins are essentially freshwater turtles. Now we haven't given up hope entirely on this female leopard. I'm convinced she has a kill in this area. It may be a little bit further away from the water than you'd assume. And if she has made a kill of a decent size, let's say an adult impala, she could feed on it for three days and therefore would be willing to take quite a long walk in order to get to water. So maybe we'll need to extend our search onto the other side of that herd of elephants. It's also in the area of where those two lioness were. So maybe the lioness are going to do us a favor and smell her kill and lead us to her. It's something that we've seen surprisingly little of. Lions finding leopards kills and leading us to some exciting situations. So we are due some credits in that department. This is a question we don't get often from Dee in Michigan. She's interested to know why is it that people don't use buffalo more often for food? And they do. Maybe you just haven't heard about it. Um, at one point, and possibly still to this day, in the Kruger National Park, you could buy buffalo pies as well as buffalo steaks from the different rest camps where you could stay. So they certainly are edible. But what you'll find with a lot of wild animals that you can feed on is that they simply aren't as easy to cook and tender as the stuff that we buy in the supermarkets like beef and lamb. So that's probably one of the main reasons, but they certainly are edible and quite tasty as long as they are prepared correctly. So there's no reason why you shouldn't or wouldn't eat a buffalo if you wanted to. Um, 
maybe you just haven't heard of it as it probably doesn't happen too much over in Michigan but it certainly is a possibility out here in Africa. Just seen two of the buffalo looking quite intently up into a riverbed. I'm not sure if it's just a false alarm. Or is there something approaching? They certainly won't be scared of... Oh, there's a saddlebolt stalk hiding behind the bush on the left there. So I doubt they would confuse that with anything dangerous. But it will be worth us keeping an eye out there. The wind is blowing from that direction to us. So maybe they've picked up the scent of some predators nearby. It's blowing gently in this direction. What a beautiful scene it is here at the Buffalo Zook Water Hole. There's one animal that we haven't showed you just yet, I don't think, and that's the hippopotamus. In the middle of the water there. Very good, Andrew. Andrew's just driven past, so I was giving him a quick greeting. He's a wonderful guy, and we're so lucky to have him as well as all of the guides that we work with in this area. They're hugely accommodating of us and our needs, which are quite different to the way they operate. And he's just asked very politely if he can join me. Which of course he can. I'm just waiting for a gap on the radio before I reply. Yes, of course, Andrew, no problem. So this is a lone hippo bull and what I'm hoping is that as this waterhole increases in level as well as the availability of food in the surrounding area increases we could get up to 8 to 15 hippos residing here in the summer months that's what happened last summer but as things began to dry out both the waterholes and the vegetation surrounding the waterholes, the hippos have moved off elsewhere. looking for any sign of some more terrapins bobbing about but I can't actually see many and that'll help to answer Ginny's question that she sent through on Twitter she'd like to know if they ever come out of the water to feed and no very very seldomly will you see them feeding out the water what you see them out the water doing is basking in the Sun quite often on the back of this hippopotamus or just on the edge of the water or on small logs protruding from any water holes oh we're in luck everyone I've just seen some large gray blobs approaching the water hole and as they get closer they're gonna get more and more excited so stand by for some elephantastic action here it's gonna let Aubrey know because he has just left the lions nearby, so it might be worth him joining us here. Orbs, there's a clump and love approaching Buffalo Sook Dam. Affirmative uh, thanks. I did. I, I had to leave William on foot. We bumped into a clump in love and I needed to get back to the Malva. <laughs> Here they come. 
Yay, look at how excited they are. All different shapes and sizes. Wonderful. I love seeing elephants trundling up to water excitedly. And interestingly enough, their major focus initially is actually to coat their bodies in cool mud. So they're obviously very hot. And rather than quenching their thirst initially, they're having an almighty mud bath. Look at the baby rolling around in there. I just motioned to VM to possibly zoom out. The hippo did a strength display, opening its mouth wide open. So I just wanted to make sure we were ready to try and capture that if it happened again. But look at this. I'm just going to creep forward because that way both Andrew and I can have a good view. Insane, they are going bananas in there. Imagine how much fun that must be, especially because they don't have to worry too much about crocodiles that could be in here. We don't see crocodiles here very often, but there have been one or two seen. And it's one thing always to remember when you're hot and bothered in the African wilderness not to be tempted to go for a swim. Even if you are fairly certain there's no crocodile around, you could be unpleasantly surprised. Well, we just spoke about this a little bit earlier, how it's going to be more likely to see elephants swimming in the summer months. And this young calf that you can see is, I guess, the closest one to doing that. They've hardly actually had anything to drink. They've had a very quick drink, but their main focus was to cool their big bodies down. Well, it's all happening here, all the big game elephants, hippo, buffalo, hornbill calling off in the distance. <laughs> Magical. Well, Marla, you absolutely correct. That was a super cute sighting. And I believe a lot of you made some funny remarks about the family had stopped in at the swimming pool for a dip. And thank you very much for all of your questions and comments and contributions. I thought I had seen a baby crocodile in the water, but I think it's just a piece of poop floating around just to the right of the hippo. It's got a very crocodile-like shaped, almost shaped like a crocodile's head. That is what got me excited, but that ain't no crocodile. That is a piece of poop. Come on, Mr. Hippo, give us one more big yawn like you did earlier when the elephants arrived. Don't be surprised at how docile 
this hippo looks at the moment because they are potentially one of the most dangerous animals in Africa, or at least mammals. They've got a very short temper and despite their quite rounded bodies and very short legs, they are incredibly powerful and can move quickly both through the water and on land. Far quicker than any human can move. Even the fastest man on the planet will be left in a pile of dust by a hippo. Now you'll notice that the only part of the hippo protruding are its ears at the moment and just like us the hippo cannot breathe through its ears but it can hold its breath for quite a long period of time. Three to five minutes but usually they hold it for about two minutes then take a short break like he's taking now. Look he's opened up his nostrils and as he puts his nose back into the water after about 10 or 15 seconds he'll close those nostrils so that water doesn't come rushing in there. They would have closed as he put his nose under the water. Let's see how long it takes before he takes his next breath. Oh, that one wasn't it. Well, that, he hasn't taken a breath yet. He's just keeping an eye on us. But they can hold their breath for long periods of time. And what's important to remember is wherever you see a hippo submerged like this one, you know that it will be standing. They don't float. It's not exceptionally deep, this water hole, even in the center. Maybe just over a meter where he is. Buffalo are behaving no differently to the hippo. They're also very, very subdued at the moment. There's a cool breeze blowing from the west. And they're taking this time to relax before the cover of darkness falls, when life becomes a little bit more scary for the prey animals. And also to chew the cud, so they are multitasking. But I think we're going to continue now. In order for us to continue, we are going to need to send you back to Jamie because I can assure you if we try and go through this dip, we are going to lose picture, which is not ideal. So I'm not sure where Jamie is or if she can receive you at the moment. But we are either going to be stuck here or we need to send you across to Jamie. Those are the only two options. And thankfully Jamie is ready and happy to have you guys jump across onto her vehicle. So enjoy and we are going to head across to the two lioness who are not far away from here. Unless of course we don't find this female leopard with her kill on the way. Oh, well that's interesting. <laughs> I think we might be live. Hi everybody. It's nice to have you back on board with us once again. Fortunately my radio caught on to the word live so I think that's what we are. Well there you go. Here's a lovely scroll to show you that we've been sitting watching. We are on the far side of Arethusa right on the western edge. And so far there's been no updates but the scroll is sitting very obligingly still. So let's see what he's up to at the moment. I wonder if he's made his home in this little log. <laughs> he appears to be frozen in surprise. <laughs> I 
Well, you certainly caught me unawares. But there you go. Let us carry on along the western boundary of Arethusa. I've just been exploring the various areas, looking for the Anderson male, if I'm honest. I still haven't seen him, and I've heard that he likes to frequent this area. And in the absence of any updates from anywhere else on Arethusa, that is what we're going to do. So if you would like to stay with me, we shall carry on up to the north. And quite, oh, there he goes, jump down, and he's gone. Well, our little squirrel friend, friend, who was very obliging, has hopped off. Let us continue on our mission. And I'm going to be heading east very, very soon. This drainage line. It's probably one of the prettiest places in Arethusa. Ah. There we go. Especially for Andy's birthday. Let me try and get it. Not switching anything else. Sorry, Angie. It's not Junior. But it is a rather pretty flower that we've, that Jandre has spotted, so there you go. I think it might be a wild fox glove. Do you think you can get it from there, Jandre? I'm going to grab my flower book in frantic haste. Because I think it is a fox glove, a wild fox glove. Very pretty little purple thing. Look how pretty that is. for Angie's birthday. I'm not going to pick it for you Angie because it seems quite happy where it is but we'll leave it growing and this can be Angie's foxglove. I'm almost at the page just to double check it. Yes, I think that might be, could well be, what we're looking at. Here we go. Oh my word, that Latin name is going to catch me out in a serious way. I think that might be what we were looking at. Or something very similar. A Ceratothica. Ooh, Ceratothesa triloba. Interestingly, can be used to treat stomach cramps and nausea. It's amazing, every little flower out here has so many different medicinal uses. It's incredible, this entire book is made up of all of the wildflowers that we see and just how many different things we can use to treat them with. Now it's quite easy to dismiss them as saying that they're not scientifically proven but of course remember that painkillers have been derived from things like willow bark so there's plenty of truth some of them are a little bit far-fetched such as the ground up bits of the knob thorn being used to augment certain body parts that definitely doesn't have any truth to it Something like sickle bush using to be used to treat sore eyes if you crush the leaves. There's just so many medicinal uses out here. Maybe we should offer some of it to Scott for whatever it was he had in his eye earlier. Oh, it's so pretty down here. Beautifully green. And now for some random reason I also feel like I've got something in my eye. So I can link it out. But 
it's still very, very quiet. And I'm always surprised, I've done this route a couple of times, I'm always surprised at the lack of animal life that you get around here. I always expect to see more in this drainage line. I'm not sure why it is. It must just be the time of year because there's a couple of really big water pans that have dried out. And I'm sure that the animals in this area in summertime must frequent them fairly regularly. We are coming up to probably one of my favorite views on Arethusa. I love looking at the old, bits of the old heritage of this area. I've spotted some life. Oh, he's going to run away. Nothing seems to want to be seen today. Where did you go, little one? There goes Buttle Fox. Oh, no. Stop, come back. It's okay. Oh, let me stop, rather, and let them get more acquainted to the idea of me. I'm looking at a family of dwarf mongoose. But interestingly, because they are not on one of the busier roads, they're much less acquainted to traffic than some of the others that we see. They're darting and dashing around in here. I don't think they're going to let us get a good view of them. Let's carry on and go and have a look at that wonderful windmill up ahead. for now. I can't take any of your questions just because my comms on this part of Arethusa are sometimes a little bit shaky. I'm just going to stop at the windmill and have a look at it. Just to have a look at these incredibly industrious birds nests that have decided that they're going to take up residence there. drawing water up from the ground and those messy untidy bits of grass and sticks there belong to the buffalo weavers making their nests it's amazing that this old thing still works it certainly seems to I wonder how deep the borehole goes but there you can see the buffalo weavers nests and they're incredibly industrious creatures. He probably built that in maybe a week and then they keep adding to it and they choose the most uncomfortable sticks and thorns to make their nests out of and they very, very commonly use structures like this or mobile phone towers, anything like that to try and use as a stable base for their nests. So we very often see them. And failing that, then they head across to big trees like knob thorns and put their leaves, their nests up like that. Very sociable birds, red billed buffalo weavers. And one of the small five as well. around onto First Windmill Road. I think the name choice there is fairly obvious. Continue our search for signs of life on Arethusa. It's 
so far I think the squirrel and the dwarf mongoose might be the owner. Oh, and a, an impala. We did see an impala. I think all of the animals have gone to ground in this heat. They're all hiding in the shade somewhere. Once again, contact with the outside world might have been restored. I'm afraid not. Still no comments. <laughs> Chandra's having quite the chuckle. <laughs> okay, well, we will continue on our bumble through Arethusa. Please bear with me. It's not that I'm ignoring your questions in any way. What I might resort to doing is just double-checking my phone. There's something about Arethusa that just plays games with us sometimes. on standby in case any of your questions can reach me in that way oh look there's some life it seems as though Scott is out and about and since I cannot really hear you terribly clearly and hear from you I think it's time we moved across to him and I will catch up with you a little bit later Welcome back everyone and we are very close to these two lioness which were left a few minutes ago by Texan sleeping in the bush off to our left but I'm just creeping along as slowly as I can just to make sure we don't overlook this leopard that I'm convinced has got a kill in this area. Tracks heading down one road straight towards the Buffles of Waterhole and then back on that same pathway in the opposite direction, which means to me but sadly whilst I was on foot with William, who's all tracker, into her trail, we bumped into a breeding herd of elephants which caused us to have to stop our search. They're dangerous animals to encounter on foot and it's better to avoid breeding herds at all costs as the mothers are very defensive of their young. Let's just take a close look in this brown ivory tree. Then if you don't mind just taking a pan through there, it's a likely spot that a leopard would hoist her kill into or his kill. We look for any strange shapes, a red carcass dangling off one of the forks of that tree. Or the leopard itself. Doesn't seem to be anything in there. But that's a good place to check. And interestingly enough, it's good we stopped here because this is, I'm guessing, where the lioness are because I can see a lot of off-road vehicle tracks heading in here. So, we are going to do the same thing and drive off-road and keep an eye out for these lioness, which I don't think are too far off the road.
we don't have any like fine leopard. I'm hoping that the lioness back of some signal issues on this vehicle today but thankfully two of our tech wizards are here on the ground one of Russian descent and one of Dutch descent Peter and Alex I'm sure it won't take long before they crack these codes hello ladies Those of you who may be enjoying your first live safari, you may be wondering why these lioness paid very little or no heed to our arrival. And that's not because they are tame, it's merely they are habituated to the vehicles and they would have grown up from little cubs being exposed to vehicles and learning that we actually play very little part in their lives, we don't harm them, they thankfully don't see us as potential prey, and we're basically neutral beings within their environments. And this is what allows us to enjoy great close-up views, and not only that, but be able to gain great insight into their lives without interfering or bothering them. If we were to jump out of the vehicle now, their response would be very different, as it would also be very different when we find them on foot, when we're tracking them. And typically what happens is they actually run away. Most wild animals, even though they're bigger <coughs> and more dangerous than we are, will avoid conflict at all costs. there's obviously a chance if you don't take heed to warning growls or startle them in very thick bush they, they could well charge you the good news for us is that they don't look exceptionally full bellied they don't look starving They're kind of in between meals and I'm hoping that, coupled with the cool breeze that's blowing over us this afternoon, is going to mean that they become active sooner rather than later. But at this time of the year, it's not uncommon for the predators only to become active after dark. So we may have a little bit of a weight on our hands. they're going to be doing for the time being is twitching their ears to try and get rid of the flies that are pestering them. Franklins are chirping around us. Well, there's been a lot of 
uncertainty as to which line is which at the moment. The main two prides of line that we get to see here on Juma and Arethusa are the Inkohuma pride, which was last counted as six members in total, five lioness and one young male. But they haven't been seen together for probably two or three weeks now. And we are certain that this is two of the five lioness. But interestingly enough, Aubrey and William are convinced that these are two of the Styx lioness. And it just goes to show that even guys that are here on a daily basis and have been here for many, many years find it difficult to distinguish between the lioness. They're not easy or as easy as leopards to differentiate. Leopards have got very unique spot patterns which make them easy to tell apart and they're also less numerous than the lion. So there's less variables. And even though Aubrey and William think that these are Styx lioness, our whole crew are convinced that they are in fact in Kahumas, but I just thought I'd let you know because it's interesting for you to know that it's not an easy business to distinguish between these animals and often you the viewers are getting the best close-up views better than us here out in the field when VM zooms in he's got a tiny monitor on his camera probably two inches by one and a half inches so he's not seeing a big picture my monitor screen is only about four inches by two inches that I get to see what he's filming and we are and focusing on many things going on, not just the screen, but lots of things that are going on around us. Today we saw one of the Birmingham male lions lying with his head down in the road and now this lioness has also got her head below her body and Jennifer in Toronto is interested to know how is it that they can lie in this angle without all their blood rushing into their head and I'm not too sure Jennifer it is a good question but I do not know the answer to it if any of you guys do know, please feel free to let me know. It's not common for them to do it though. And I mean this angle that she's lying at isn't a huge one. Whereas the Birmingham boy the other day, I mean his head was far below his body. Down into the dip on a road. But I wouldn't say it's common to see them doing it. Although in the last few days it does seem to be the case. For those of you who don't know who the Birmingham boys are, they are a coalition of five up-and-coming male lions who have staked claim to Juma in the very recent past. And Rudy in California would like to know if these are the same two lionesses that those Birmingham boys chased off the remains of their maggot-infested buffalo kill. And yes, as far as I'm aware, these are the same two lioness. It's been weeks now since Junior, the young male from this pride, has been seen. It'll be really interesting to know what's happened to him. But we may never know the final answer to that. Which is a scary thought, I'm sure. A lot of the viewers and 
myself included, thought that we would certainly see a bit more of him, but we may well never ever see him again. He could be dead for all we know. But it really would be wonderful for this pride to meet up with the remaining members. little bugs are floating around there that VM spotted. They could be tiny little bees. You do get some miniature bees and they could have a hive nearby there. The name of them has just slipped my mind though. What is the name of these tiny little bees? Again, they make the sweetest of nectar if it is them. Or honey, rather. Quite a pretty scene with that setting sun. Probably about another 20 minutes or so before the sun dips below the horizon. And before I did make that comment about the possibility of Young Junior being dead, Cacino John mentioned how nice it would be if we did get to see them reunites and of course it would be a wonderful, wonderful sighting to share with all of you and be involved in. And it could happen, simply that nobody's seen them doesn't mean that they aren't nearby. These areas are massive and as I'm sure a lot of you have got to learn with the help of the drone flying us around, you get to see that the blocks are quite large and it's difficult to know exactly where all the animals are especially at this time of the year the roads have become quite hard after the first rains that we got about it's quite a while back now but those ro roads are still solidified like cement after the first rains and it'll continue to make our lives tricky as we head into the summer months obviously once the rain falls there'll be a period where the roads are soft and mushy but with this baking sun with temperatures up into the 40 degrees celsius mark the roads quickly bake and become rock hard and even if a dinosaur was to walk down one of the roads it would be difficult to see their tracks let alone a lion so not an easy job we have going forward but one of the theories that I've come up with as to how we managed to still find game during the summer months is that because the vegetation is so thick the animals are less inclined to walk off the road where they'll be met with a lot of resistance and therefore they stick to the roads as their main highways and pathways for traveling. So let's hope that's the case again this summer. I'm sure it will be. And last summer we were spoiled with some incredible sightings of lots of different animals. Speaking of which, the wild dog have been away for most of the winter. They've been denning elsewhere. But it's not going to be long before they pay us a surprise visit and hopefully spend some time back on Juma. They're ins insane animals to follow especially when they're on the move. I don't think there's a more exciting animal to follow whilst on safari compared to the wild dog. There's often more than four or five of them in a pack and they are exceptionally uh, successful hunters. And if you follow them, you're bound to at least be around them when they have a kill. You very seldom see the takedown because they chase their prey quite long distances. They've got extreme stamina. But that's another animal that we can look forward to seeing in the summer months. Even though they are harder to track down and even though the bush is thick, they are probably going to return into this area, which is something to look forward to. Nothing's changed with the sleeping beauties here. Thanks very much to Diane, who sent through an update on Twitter regarding differentiating the Inkahuma lioness from the Styx lioness. And she says the Styx lioness lack the wobbly bumps on their elbows, which the Inkahuma lioness do have. And even though 
that is a sign of feline TB. It's not to say that the Styx lioness don't have it. They may be well, just not showing those signs yet, but all of the lions within the Kruger National Park, as well as all the buffalo, have got TB. It's not hugely detrimental to their health, but in times of extreme hardship, that TB will start coming through and showing more prominently. Sadly from this angle though we can't really see any of these bumps to show you. It's usually on the front arms or legs rather that you get to see these wobbly bumps but you can't really see them from the angle that they're lying at now. I'm wondering if we shouldn't go for a quick drive around the block and see if we can't find any sign of this leopard and then return to these lines. If we do a loop around that block that they're in, which I'm guessing the leopard is in as well, it'll only take us about 10 minutes, so I don't think we're going to miss any action. What's the rule to be spotted over there? Oh, interesting. Is that a kudu, VM? Daika. A daika? Mm. Just had a bit on the leaf. Okay. Well, I thought it was one of the largest antelope we get in this area, but it, in fact one of the smallest. Not to say that the lions won't try and catch it though, but at the moment... These lions are not looking in hunting mode, but that could change as soon as they realize that there is a potential meal near, nearby. I'm guessing this little dyke is going to be too cunning for them though and it's either going to smell them or see them before they have any idea that it's here. It's left. Well, it appears that it has already evaded the danger. Well done for spotting that though VM. VM has got eagle eyes and often helps us to find interesting things. It wasn't too long ago that we were driving around Arethusa when he stopped me, alerted me to some leopard tracks on the road. We stopped, looked at them, they looked very fresh, looked up ahead, about 25 meters off the road to our left, there was Shadow lying down. And for afternoon of Thursday, she was caught. Large male leopard, but as for the east, it's so much longer than ours. And how it works is that when you're in a society with static uh, cats or static animals of any sort. We only move one vehicle at a time and that's just to emphasize our respect for the animals and to make sure that we don't ever scare them or get in their way. By only moving one vehicle at a time it means there's less ambient noise and if anything was to approach them, be it danger or potential prey, at least they would be able to hear it. We'll have a method behind the supplement and you can see him struggling to get his safari limousine 
through all this foliage without getting his guess. Jess, I think you're on the wrong channel. Hello, Ephraim. Hello, everyone. Welcome back everybody and we just wanted to show you this beautiful image of the full moon rising. Now apparently there's going to be a lunar eclipse tonight, it's also a super moon. It's going to be at 4.30 our time in here in South Africa so I think I'm going to be up and about watching that. I can't think of a better setting than to watch a lunar eclipse. And Jandre and myself in the search for life on Arethusa have come right to the southern boundary and discovered quite an extraordinary view. Look at how beautiful that is. And that's happening, of course, to the east of us. And, as naturally happens at this time of day, the sun is setting off to the west of us, so let's have a look at this incredible vista that we've got in this direction. I'm not going to do too much talking, I'm just going to let you watch. of those fireball sunsets at the end of a very hot day. I've definitely noticed that the haze and dust is back already after the rain. Yeah, the Cape turtle doves in the background. Quite a few birches starlings chirping as well. It's still very, very warm. It smells, it's got that dusty smell to the bush once again. Although at least accompanied now by the fresh scent of the odd flower. Definitely I don't know if this is possible, but to me it definitely smells greener out here. But I'm still very, very warm. And I think it's going to be another beautiful day tomorrow. I mean, how is this? I mean, from that incredibly thick mist and that sunrise that we started with, to this fireball sunset at the end of the day after beautifully blue, clear skies, with not a hint of cloud and not a hint of wind, it's dead, dead still out here. I mentioned a cooling breeze earlier, that's completely disappeared. It's so still. And it's, the silence is almost heavy. I don't know how to describe it. We can hear the birds chattering. But below that, there's an incredible level of silence. 
and a depth to it that you won't find anywhere else. Just a quick message to let you all know that Fireside Chat will be taking a hiatus for the week, so we will not be doing Fireside Chat this evening. It's such a beautiful evening that we want to be out and about looking for animals to show you, and I'm sure we will be back next week with Fireside Chat. Oh, that's looking really beautiful. You can hear the turtle dove a little bit louder now. Watching as the sun dips. I heard somewhere that due to the curvature of the earth and the reflection and reflection, refraction of light, I can't remember how it works and I don't remember understanding it at the time. But supposedly the sunset we watch is an optical illusion and the sun has already set by the time we're watching it go down. I honestly don't know how it works so please don't shout at me because I can't remember the explanation but it's still a mind-boggling thought that the sun we're watching is already gone. fast it goes towards the end. Oh, of course, that is how it works. <laughs> the speed of light and the time that it takes for the sun to reach, the sun's light to reach the earth. What's it, eight minutes? Something like that? That would explain it. And look how fast the sun's dipping down now. So, of course, the sun's already gone. Just takes those extra few minutes for it to reach us. A bit of a blonde moment there. Here it goes. gone pretty much on a beautiful summer's evening. Sure, what a view. And I know I've mentioned this before but this is definitely one of my favorite times to be out and about in the bush. But there are animals to find, so let us carry on now that we've seen the sun disappear and dip below the horizon. Let's go see what else we can find to show you. So quiet. Essentially, Jean Grey and I have had this entire piece of land to ourselves today. And that's because somebody called Sana Yon Elephant Plain. That's her territory, and she's a very, very young cub, only a couple of months old.
Stop to try and get you guys a snake skin that had been shed onto a little bush that we passed earlier, but it's kind of been glued together as it's been wet by the rain. And while I got off to look for that snake skin, I heard a squirrel alarm calling. And I just want to try and get closer to it in the hope that it has seen this leopard that we're looking for. So, everyone cross fingers in the hope that there's going to be a leopard nearby. So let me stop again to see if I can hear any more alarm calls. Please keep calling squirrel. This is looking better. Fingers around my ears there to help our hearing increase the satellite dish's size. Come on, please, can we get lucky? There's a few. Mate, oh, please don't fill up. Okay. There's a few big trees here where a leopard could have hoisted a kill into, and that's where the audio of the squirrel's coming from. We're going to try and find an easy way in here. It could be that the squirrel's seen a snake or a bird of prey. But it's been so long since we've seen a leopard that I'm just going to go for gold here. Okay, we're getting closer to it. It's off to our left now. we tried. It looked like a Warburg's eagle but could have been something else. It was just on a marula tree in front of us. So, not a leopard. But at least a predator. It could well have been a leopard. <coughs> as well just continue driving off-road until we get back to a road although oh, maybe we should just head back to the road the way we can because it is incredibly thick here no, we'll find a way out this way everyone it's so exciting following up on squirrel alarm calls or any animals alarm calls really even though quite often you get let down and rather than taking you any further on this bushwhacking escapade we're going to send you back to Jamie back onto our vehicle when we are closer to the lions or a road. See you later. Welcome back and I do apologize for losing you somewhere there down south of the airstrip. We were right on the southern board, the southern boundary of Arethusa. And I guess that just tipped the signal a little bit too far. We went down a slight dip. Anyway, I've made myself, made my way back north to 
make sure that we stay with you while we can. And this is also one of my favorite areas. It's got this incredible green color to it. There's so many new bush willow leaves and then of course the guaris that are great. Oh, I think Scott has found a snake. Let's head across to him and I will catch up with you a little bit later. False alarm, everyone. <laughs> we thought we had seen a snake in the tree, but it was just a bird that was poking its head out of the little hole. Sorry about that. <laughs> heard we can send you back to Jamie now and we will catch up a little bit later well welcome back and it seems as though the animals of Juma and Arethusa have been out to fool us once again from the hornbill that wouldn't to the impala that wouldn't earlier and now the snake that wasn't or didn't exist it has been quite highly entertaining I'm grabbing some new shoots the silver cluster leaves are starting to look very velvety and beautiful as they start to get their new leaves don't worry i'm actually going to stop next to the actual tree so we can have a look at them the reason i've stopped is to give them a taste test so here we go here's a nice example of a silver cluster leaf tree that's getting its nice new velvety leaves it's the one just off to my right here and i know i got asked a question about the differences in vegetation and topography between arethusa and juma and these are one of the biggest indicators as to one of the main differences and that's the fact that arethusa is quite a large sea plant and these plants are the perfect indication and they're actually where we're sitting we're almost completely surrounded by them now the reason that I randomly plucked some leaves from there is I want to do a little bit of a taste test now the silver cluster leaves are famous for drying out the saliva in your mouth if you eat their leaves so essentially they're very very astringent and I've mentioned before that in the same way as with spike thorns they've got that astringent, astringent chemical and the little baby elephants use it to help relieve the pain or they suspect that they use it to help relieve the pain of teething now I've eaten big mature cluster leaves before but the question in my mind as I went past that randomly popped into my head was are these leaves the same if they knew do they have the same effect so they're very soft and very velvety looking and I'm going to give them a quick taste test and let you know it's an experiment Hmm. Yes. Definitely. Probably even more so. Hmm. Then the adult leaves. And I'm going to grab some water now because otherwise I'm not going to be able to talk to you. I have essentially no feeling now in my tongue. But that was an interesting little experiment. A sudden burst of curiosity took hold. Okay. Ooh, that's better. Oh. Anyway, so as I said, very useful indicator of sea plants. So essentially they grow up in areas where there's a nice hard impermeable layer under the soil that doesn't allow moisture to seep through it. And that essentially pushes all of the moisture that's flowing through the soil to the top and it gets very soggy and that's a condition that these trees really favor <coughs> I'm still trying to cough up bits of silver cluster leaf Terminalia cerisea referring to the silky nature of the leaves cerisea Last time 
I drove this road, all of the little side muddy pans had water in them. It's now gone completely dry again. And it's really very important that we get some big rains fairly soon. We should be able to last another month or so before all of the dams start to dry out except for those that are pumped. So Arethusa and Juma will keep their water, although definitely not the water that's right in front of the Juma dam camera that is all but gone. And I actually got quite a shock when I drove past Treehouse Dam earlier today. It's also become the sort of cracked and dried up mud for the most part. to Safari Main Driveway and I think it's time to head back to Juma and start to scour the western edge from that side and see if we can find any signs of leopards coming across that way. And I'm about to hit the Triple M boundary and when we get there we can have a long look down it and talk about where the Birmingham boys are because they're on that road. They're just a little bit too far for us to be able to go. in that respect definitely hasn't played out entirely how I expected it to. It seems as though the Matimba males have moved down into Londolozi and are busy causing their own set of havoc there, which is very interesting. I expected at their stage of life for them to either fight with the Birmingham boys or become completely nomadic. It is going to be interesting to see, especially with the Majingis now also reaching quite an older age. And I think, as far as I know, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's only four of them moving around in this area. It would be interesting to see, as far as I knew, that was the area that the Matimbas had moved into was sort of the Jingulani territory, but I don't know if they just had a very large area. Welcome back everybody. We got lucky. And this female leopard is obviously eating a very salty kill, possibly a diker. VM seems to think diker are quite salty. Because she's come for another drink at the water hole. Who knows, maybe it's not the same leopard that we've been tracking. It looks actually like quite a young leopard now. We've just got you. I don't know who this is. I mean, this is the territory of Karula, but I'm not convinced it's her. I'm not sure what you guys think. Some of our leopard identification experts out here may be able to help us. But I think this is a young leopard, a young female. She looks flawless. There's no notches in her ears. Karula's got quite tatty ears. Not very tatty, but certainly more tatty than this, it looks like. Now, hopefully, what is going to happen is she's going to take us back to the kill that she's feeding on. Take a close look at her face. Sadly, we can't get closer to her because we're having signal problems here. Otherwise, I would naturally have parked down on the water's edge, getting us a great low angle, but that is not going to be possible. Look at how cautious she is as she's drinking, even though she's a predator. She needs to be very cautious of other leopard, lion, wild dogs. So even quite a nerve-wracking experience for the predators to take a drink. 
she certainly is making the most of it. And the guides will be absolutely relieved that we've managed to find her because they've got huge pressure to show their guests all the iconic animals of the Sabi Sands, the leopard being one that the Sabi Sands is most famous for. And it's been days since we've last seen one. And thankfully they're going to light her up with their spotlight for us. Oh, this is a young female. It's not Karula, I don't think. And I wonder where she's going to head to from here. She may have a kill very close by. And what we're going to do is just allow Aubrey and the other guests, Ephraim's joining as well to get a good view of her before we reposition and I actually fear that if we do reposition we're going to lose pictures so I think our best bet is to stay here for now hmm she is heading down into an incredibly incredibly tricky area to follow so that may be the last glimpse we have of her but let's see what happens you're probably going to lose picture well welcome back and we had a slight problem with Jigger and I'm afraid we just had some slight problems with Scott's signal as well and I know you're very keen to see Karula um, and hopefully he will be back up and running very very soon it might just be a temporary blip as she goes through that drainage line and once she gets out from the other side of that damn wall then hopefully we'll be able to see her again and it's just been one of those days on our side Jigger's going to slowly limp home in low range very gently that appears to be, she all of a sudden just popped out of gear completely into neutral. But we've got it now, Jandre managed to get it into low range. It might be okay. We're going to continue on our mission very, very slowly. And unfortunately, this as well. Welcome back everyone and now you're going to be able to get some great views of her a bit closer up and take some screenshots. We need to identify this leopard. I don't know who it is yet. I got a brief look with my binoculars and because there's been so many tracks up and down in this area I've already heard the other guides Texan and Ephraim saying that they could be cubs. nestled somewhere in this thicket. So that's a very exciting prospect. Imagine if we see some tiny newborn cubs. If there are in fact cubs here, we'll all make our way actually out of the sighting as quick as possible. It's a huge speculation at this stage. But if in fact there are cubs here, because it is after dark, we will not stay. And in the future we would only limit the sighting to one vehicle at a time to slowly get the clubs used to the vehicles as part of the habituation process. It's incredibly thick here. I 
to keep very quiet and listen just to make sure we don't hear any contact calls. She doesn't look full bellied, which makes me think that there is not a kill here. So that was our initial thought that she could have a kill. But the fact that we're not seeing her full bellied is an indication that something else may have be going on. saying it could possibly be Tandi or Shiluva. Tandi I've never seen before, but Shiluva I've seen once on a rainy day last summer. to check her belly for any suckle marks but difficult to sell she does have a bit of a loose flap of skin oh what a beautiful shot that was as she disappeared into the shadows I'm just going to try and reposition one more time after dark and leopard does have gobs I don't know why all the guides and myself have got this feeling but we've just got this feeling it wouldn't make sense for us to follow her after dark and attract any unnecessary attention to her den site where she's keeping them it could just be a fallen down log or a hole in a termite mound or a very thick donga or ravine where she's decided to nestle the cubs there's not necessarily a safe structure where the cubs are completely inaccessible from other predators like hyenas, like lions. So exciting stuff, but I do think it's our best option to head out of here and come back here in the morning to see if we can get any more updates or clues as to whether in fact she does have cubs. If she does have cubs here, we'll notice a lot of her footprints in this general area coming backwards and forwards to the dam. Kind of like why I assumed she had a kill earlier because we, there were tracks going backwards and forwards on the same trail and what may have happened is that she um, actually was just hunting in one area and then not going too far and returning on the same pathway to nurse her cubs. Whew, exciting stuff. And Aubrey just said he is convinced that she does have cubs because he said he did see her suckle rings, nursing rings. Oh, good there, Vian. We will send you back to me while we get out of this mess. Welcome back. And how 
wonderful is it that you got to see Karula, even if she is being her usual mysterious and elusive self. That is wonderful news. Oh, it sounds like it might not even have been Karula. We're not sure who it is. Still a very special sighting and wonderful that we managed to get those glimpses of a beautiful leopard. Now Digger and I and Jandre are still slowly limping our way home. Digger's doing very well. Casually in low range, third, just gently making our way along and doing something of a very sedate night drive. Looking around, seeing if we can spot any eye shine. Now, I didn't see a a honey badger on this road once, once, and I've seen his tracks regularly, so I'm keeping my eyes peeled for him. I think it might still be a little bit warm, just because it has been such a hot day, but you just never know what's going to come out and about. It is one of those joys of a live safari. My best efforts I still haven't seen an art park it is one of those weird things that I appear to have somehow developed really bad luck over I know that they are fairly rare in this area but I've certainly been proved very efficient at finding their old holes with my vehicle wheels so I wouldn't be at all surprised if there's plenty living in this block over here. Oh. See if we can get that. Oh, did you see that, Chandra? The tail just disappeared into the hole. There's something in there. I think it might have been a genet. Could have been a bush baby, but where did it go? Could well be nesting here. Where did it disappear to? It ducked down into that hole there in the tree. Somewhere around here. There, it went in there. Let's just. I'm just going to give the tree another scan see if we can see what it was. Maybe it might come out if we sit nice and quietly. Let's go all the way up. I'm keeping an eye on the hole. Let's just wait and see if whatever that disappearing tail was, it definitely was a nocturnal creature. It wasn't a squirrel or anything like that. It had that very bright eye shine. Keep your eyes peeled. And it looked like it had a banded tail, which is what made me think Janet. I wonder how big that hole is. I'm not going to shine directly on the hole. I'm going to keep the light off it slightly. Let's see if this little creature comes out. like that maybe. Now, I think a genet would be too big to fit in that hole just looking at the way that it is. Although you'd be surprised what they can squeeze themselves into. Animals are always astounding in that way. But there must be some kind of hollow because I definitely saw the tail disappear in there. Even though it looks like just a dent. Oh dear, I don't know what it was, but it doesn't seem to want to brave the outside world. Just take my spotlight off it for now. Nope. I don't 
know what it was. It looked very tiny, very shiny, forward-facing eyes, so definitely a nocturnal animal. It shone like one of those hazard stickers or a hazard suit. So definitely something along those lines, but whatever it is, it's feeling a little bit shy and isn't going to come back out again. Still interesting, you just never know. We'll keep an eye on this tree. I'll try and remember where it is. We can keep an eye out in future. Okay, well, back out again. And luckily we're not in the block with the art far coals just yet, or not in the area with the art far coals just yet. And as I head out, <laughs> Tetra has commented that Tingana might have been responsible for my lack of art park sightings. Now, for those of you who don't know, Tingana is a big male leopard who apparently has quite the appetite for art fox. And it's not unusual for leopards to specialize in a certain type of prey. They do do it. But it seems as though apparently Tingana really, really favors art fox. It's interesting. It's very, very interesting. Here we go. We'll leave whatever little nocturnal creatures in there. seem like it was going to be brave enough to come out. Jigger continue on its slow way, forcing my feet off pedals, and just let it carry itself back home. I wonder what that little creature was. I guess it must have been a bush baby, but it didn't. It had such a clearly banded tail, which is what made me think Janet. I wonder where it's gone off into hiding. to one of my favorite viewpoints of this area and I'm going to stop up ahead so that we can have a look at the moon coming through. It really is a most incredibly beautiful evening. Even when things go wrong and cars have moments and animals don't quite do what you want them to or expect them to at least, there's always these beautiful moments on evenings like this that are so, so special. my lights out for a moment so we can have a look at this glorious moon that's off to my right it is looking absolutely incredible it'll be difficult to capture but it really is and I'm so looking forward to being up really early look at that there we go well done Jandre that 
I'm going to be up very, very early this morning, or tomorrow morning rather, to watch the lunar eclipse. And Tess, you were wondering, because you're from Ohio, and you will be seeing the blood moon lunar eclipse. And yes, absolutely, so will we. We will get it. It will be first thing in the morning for us. And it's going to be spectacular to see. I'm very excited. You have to find a nice viewpoint because it's going to be right as the moon is setting. We'll have to move up somewhere nice and high. Beautiful still night like this. I think it's time for us to carry on. Let's see what other little animals we can find out and about. Well done, Jigger. Done well. Actually really excited about it getting up that early it's been quite a long time since I've done that and I haven't done it while I've worked at Wild Earth I've been on a couple of night drives but it will be very nice to go out on an early early morning excursion it's the coolest time of the day it's sort of around three o'clock in the morning by 4 30 it's almost, almost right at the cusp of starting to get light now the sun's already risen by quarter to six, so it'll be nice to head out a little bit earlier and see what has been happening on Juma whilst we've been sleeping. Although I think that a very hot, very strong cup of coffee is going to be required if I do do that. as well about having such gifted cameramen is that they would be able to maybe be able to capture it on camera in a way that I would never have any hope of doing. my side lights back on so I can talk to you properly without missing anything. It has been a very interesting afternoon. Now we didn't have much luck on Arethusa but amazing that Scott managed to find that leopard. And of course the big question is who is it? Well guys let us know what you think. You can always send that through to us. Send us your screenshots. Send us whatever you can and let's see if we can figure out who this mystery lady is. I think that would be really, really interesting to know. And if it's not Karula, then who is it? And who is she? What is she doing? Remember that you can send those things, those answers through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv, and we'd love to hear from you. I did track a mail up towards that corner of Biffles Hook Dam, and Brent thought he heard one calling there, so something's happening up on that side in the lion, the leopard dynamics of the area. And of course tomorrow for the Sunrise Safari we'll definitely be following up and trying to work out where they went, as well as those two Nkuhuma lionesses who've been wandering out and about. Now Arethusa, on the other hand, didn't have very much that I saw in the way of fresh tracks, but you never know, tomorrow's another day and the animals cover these enormous distances at night. Well, a big thank you to Jandre, and of course I have to say goodbye as well on behalf of Scott, who's unfortunately his signal hasn't come back up. But a big thank you to you all, as well as a big thank you to Jess and Nikki and FC. And on behalf of everyone, we'd just like to apologize for Scott's 
abrupt departure from the scene in the odd moments. We'll definitely be working on that. Well, have a wonderful day and enjoy the blood moon eclipse wherever you are in the world. And we will catch up with you on the sunrise safari. Bye-bye, guys.